Guess what day it is? Oh, it's French Fry Day, it's French Fry Day, so grab your fries and say hooray! David French is here to play on French Fry Day! It's French Fry Day! David French, welcome back. Sky, great to see you. Uh, we are doing this a week later than we expected because you were sick with COVID. Glad to see you've recovered. Um, so here's the thing. It's been a month since we've talked. Yeah. A lot has happened. David. Has anything happened, Scott? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, made, I made a short list of things that we could talk about today. All right. So here's what has happened since we last talked. Joe Biden had the worst presidential debate in history, sending the Democratic Party into an absolute meltdown. The Supreme Court ruled that presidents are immune from prosecution for official acts. Gosh, wow. Okay, it's been a while. Donald Trump was nearly killed by an assassin's bullet at a rally in, in Pennsylvania. He vowed to shift his tone from division to unity, which lasted about 30 minutes. J.D. Vance, who once called Donald Trump cultural heroine and America's Hitler, was picked by Trump to be his new Mike Pence. The Republican Party has removed all pro-life language from its party platform. <laughs> Hulk Hogan was a headliner at the, at the Republican National Co Convention. Mm -hmm. Biden vowed that he would stay in the race, saying that only God Almighty would cause him to drop out. And then he dropped out. He endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris, whose nomination was basically uncontested. She raised over $200 million in the first few hours of her com campaign, which shattered every record and it sent the Republican Party into a meltdown. The Paris Olympics opened by mocking the Last Supper, provoking the outrage of Christians around the world. And to top it all off, at the San Diego Comic-Con, Marvel Studios announced that Robert Downey Jr. is returning to the MCU, not as Tony Stark, but as Doctor Doom. So, David, what do you want to talk about? I mean, you ended with the lead. We got to go with Doctor Doom. <laughs> okay. Fine, let's do it. Let's start with Doctor Doom. Uh, I mean, that list sounded like a, a, a new version of We Didn't Start the Fire by yeah. Billy Joel. Like, there's so much that's happened in the last month. Um, let's do this. Before we end, uh, let's get your thoughts on Dr. Doom and okay. Robert Downey Jr. Okay. But uh, let's back up a little bit. We're not going to obviously cover all of this. And people have heard tons of commentary on most of these topics elsewhere. Um, we want to go a little bit deeper, though, into J.D. Vance, not particularly J.D. Vance, but some of the controversy around his statements around people not having enough children, singleness, yeah. disparaging of, of um, what do you call them, couch sitting cat Childless women? cat ladies. Childless cat Childless ladies. Childless cat ladies. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, explain some of where, maybe to steel man it a little bit, where's J.D. Vance coming from on some of this rhetoric, if it can be steel manned at all? Well, it, it can be. I mean, childless cat ladies is very difficult right. to steal man. Yeah, that's just derision. A pro-natalist message is very easy to steal man. I mean, so essentially the argument is, is that the United States is just not having enough babies, that we're um, reproducing at a rate way below the rate of replacement. So uh, all other things being equal, no immigration, et cetera, eventually America is going to get older and smaller. The population will shrink. The population will become disproportionately old. And you just have trouble having a vibrant economy, a vibrant nation, if the nation isn't growing, isn't even reproducing itself. And Which so, is a common trend in most developed economies. It is nearly universal, Scott. Right. So th this is the thing that's, that's wild about this. So a lot of times we talk about this like it's an American story. It's a universal story. Now, there are some countries, uh, Israel is a notable exception, where it continues to have children way above the rate of replacement. But if you look across the world, and it doesn't matter if it's European culture, East Asian culture, etc., the more developed the economy gets, the fewer children women have. I mean, this goes back to Soviet U.S. days back in the Cold War, as the Soviets got more developed economically. They had fewer children. And so what we're dealing with here in the natalism argument and debate is essentially almost a universal sort of human phenomenon. With greater economic growth comes decreased childbearing. Right. And some countries are much worse off than us. I mean, South Korea, for example, is and Japan, right? Japan, much worse off than the United States. But this is a this is a universal phenomenon. And I think it's safe to say nobody knows what to do about it. 
Okay, so but there's a different there's different avenues into this topic. So right. one of them is the economic one, and that's where I often encounter it. When you look at say Japan, their deep concern is if people are not having children, then you're not replacing people in the workforce as they age out into retirement right. and eventually death, and then you have a stagnant or, or shrinking economy because you don't have enough workers in that economy. There have been all kinds of、uh, economic incentives. By the government of Japan to try to incentivize people having children, and it's not worked.、Um, another avenue, though, into this topic is not just economic; it's cultural. And、right. there are some, not just in the United States, but in other places, that are arguing we need to have more children, otherwise we will be replaced by immigrant populations or or cultures that are deemed to be foreign. A big issue in a lot of Western Europe, and so. When you look at J.D. Vance and some of the other people in that, you know, on the right side of the spectrum, on the pro-natalist viewpoint, are they coming from the economic point of view? They're concerned for the economic growth and stability or、uh, expansion of American power, or is it rooted in culture and so-called replacement theory that white Americans aren't having enough kids, and if we don't have more kids, people of color are going to replace us? I, I, I also say there's maybe a third bucket, which which would be a bucket that I fit into, which would be sort of、okay. like the lo- love and vitality bucket. <laughs> that, in other words, that having children, loving children, is itself in many ways、uh, an act that transforms society in many beneficial ways. Because although parenting is not the only way that this happens. I want to be very clear because, we, as we, I think we'll get into, Sky casting aspersions on childless people is, I think, not only wrong but unbiblical.、Um, Absolutely. So, but I do think that there is a love-based argument for parenting that this is one of the primary ways that we learn to live without ourselves as the center of our own world. And that one of the universal challenges that human beings face is we tend to naturally fall in on ourselves. We tend to naturally view ourselves as sort of the center of our own universe. That everything else sort of revolves around us, and that's a, a natural human tendency. But the reality is that if a society is going to flourish, if a society is truly going to function well, we have to be others-oriented people. And one of the primary ways that you become an others-oriented person. Is through the love that a parent has for a child, and I think that's maybe a, a different bucket. That it's not looking at children as sort of an economic advantage to society, or that it's not looking at children as sort of like the cultural key to to winning a culture war. But instead, it's looking at children and saying, "I love that kid," and in loving that kid, not only does the love that I have for that kid enrich the child's life. Um, also, the love for that kid transforms me. We're both fathers. You're also a grandfather.、Mm-hmm. We've experienced that transforming effect、yes. of having to、yeah. give yourself in service of another, especially a, a powerless and innocent other. And anyone who has loved a child knows that that feeling.、Um, from a Christian point of view, from a theological point of view, obviously we would affirm that.、Mm-hmm. But Scripture would go a step further and say the church community functions as a family. As a、right. spiritual family, and Paul especially uses familial language when speaking about the church. He talks about honoring older men and women in the church as mothers and fathers, and younger ones as brothers and sisters. And he talks about the household of faith. And I mean, so for even people who may not have biological or adopted children of their own, there is a sense if you belong to the church community, that role is one where you are called to seek the interests of others, to sacrifice、yes. your. Well-being and care for those others, whether they are children or, or brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether it's a, it's still a formative environment in which that ethic is upheld and affirmed and blessed. So, yeah, exactly. All of that fits under this category of kind of Christian maturity, where you learn to sacrifice your desires for the sake of others, which is a model of Christ's love for us.、Um, J.D. Vance goes a step further, though, and he argues that childless elites. Childless progressive elites, he says, are borderline sociopathic, and that <laughs> they should not be running institutions in this country because by not having children, they're not invested in the future of this country, and therefore they don't really care about this country. They only care about themselves. That's kind of the construct he's making, which seems like kind of an extreme caricature of the Christian ethic. 
where it says having children makes you invest and care about others. He's saying, well, not having children means that you can't possibly care for others. Right. And, and that seems really bizarre. It, it does seem, and can I see use the word weird? <laughs> it, it does, you know, which is a, a, a word that has become very salient in the national discussion lately, but mm -hmm. it is very bizarre. And as I said earlier, it's not biblical. Um, this is not the biblical command that every single person should have children. Now, I know there is, you know, be fruitful and multiply is sort of a generalized kind of, you know, post-Diluvian kind of imperative. But there is also um, Paul quite clearly, um, Jesus also quite clearly talks about the high calling that does exist of singleness, right? And, and so this idea that there's some in, something inherently wrong with, with either singleness or childlessness mm -hmm. is just not, it's just not biblical at all. It, it's just completely wrong. And, and also experientially, it's really wrong. Some of the people that I have found to be among the most public spirited in my life are people who don't have kids. And in many ways, the, the fact that they don't have kids has given them more time to invest in other ways in their community. Because as anyone who's, you know, I have three kids, as anyone who has kids knows that there's a period of life where your horizon narrows considerably, <laughs> that all of your focus or almost 90% of your focus is the next soccer practice, the next piano practice, the next, you know, a standardized testing deadline, the next this, the next that, and you really narrow down to your own family, which is fine and wonderful. There's a season for that in life when you really have to do that. But this sort of idea that you're in inherently more forward-looking, inherently more public-spirited because you have children is just experientially wrong. And in fact, I have seen people become incredibly selfish about their children in ways that are toxic to other people. So it's not necessarily that they become, you know, sort of little balls of selflessness we've all seen how parents can become remarkably selfish in right. the way they uh hover around and circle around and prioritize their children over everybody else and so i do think it is not inherently virtuous either direction it is how how you manifest your parenting or how you manifest your singleness, childlessness, whatever, that really defines your virtue, not the mere fact that you have kids or don't have kids. Right. In, in the article I read, it's on CNN uh, that cites a bunch of things that J.D. Vance has said over the years on this topic. He talks about how his own experience of becoming a father was transformative for him and helped heal a lot of the wounds from his very challenging childhood, which he wrote about in Hillbilly Elegy. And it feels like he's projecting quite a bit that his experience becoming a father and the positive effect it apparently had on him must be true for everybody. And it seems like there's a failure of imagination going on here, both because we all know stories of people who have procreated and they remain terrible. <laughs> they remain terrible. Yeah. Oh, horrible. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes right. they inflict and that on their kids, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it also takes some imagination to realize that somebody can have a very different life experience than I have had. And yet their life experience can also be used, whether you believe by God or just circumstance, in shaping them into a kind, generous, selfless person. And it doesn't have to look like the same course that God has taken me on to form those qualities in me. But he argues, and this is a direct quote, he says, the fact that so many people, especially in America's leadership class, don't have that in their lives is problematic. And our country's low birth rates have made many elites sociopaths. What? I, what? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's just nuts. I mean, that's just nuts. I mean, look, I have seen sociopathic parents. I've seen sociopathic single people. Parenting doesn't make you a better person. Right. Um, uh, many times, uh, parenting, I've seen pe people manifest the worst of themselves in parenting. But, you know, there's something that you said, Sky, that I think is really important here. And that is something that was really good for him. And I don't have any doubt at all mm -hmm. that forming a family, and by all accounts, J.D. is a 
good husband, good father. Like I've never heard a bad word about him in that circumstance and that. And and there's no question that he lacked that if you read his biography, you just your heart goes out to him as a kid that the quote unquote father figures that were often in his life, my goodness. And so I don't have any question that forming a family has been incredibly wonderful for J.D. Vance. But here's a problem we have sort of more generally, Sky, and that is we universalize from our own personal experiences. Yeah. And so that we say that this thing that has been transformative to me, we're not content to just say this thing was transformative for me and explain why. We have to continue on and say, and it will be for you. And if you resist me, there's something wrong with you. If you disagree with me, there's something wrong with you. I have unlocked the key. And this is a constant, this isn't just an issue in politics. This is one of the things that's sort of driving us all crazy is that we're constantly exposed to sort of an influencer slash advocacy culture that is taking, here's what works for me, and then, or here's what works for me, I think so at this point in my life, and turning it into a universal imperative again and again and again. And not only is it arrogant to do this, but it also drives people nuts, sometimes yeah. somewhat justifiably, to be constantly bombarded with authoritative commands about how to live your life with the, uh, the other side of the argument, then there's something fundamentally wrong with you. You're a sociopath, which would be extreme language from Vance, but that there's something fundamentally wrong with you if you don't agree with me on this thing that has helped me. Okay, so this, this takes us into a couple of different directions that may be fun. The first book I ever wrote was about the intersection of consumer culture and Christianity. Right. And in part of my research for that book, I was studying uh, a marketing professor, I think from the University of Florida. And he had kind of looked at how evangelical Christianity and popular American marketing culture kind of intersected. And he noticed this observation. He said the best time to get somebody to advertise a product is after they've bought it because <laughs> off because often there's buyer's remorse right you yeah, buy yeah, yeah. a say you buy a new truck or car or whatever and you know a couple of days later you're you're like oh man should i really have done that the way to overcome your sense of regret is to convince your neighbor to make the same purchase or convince someone else that's because when they then make the same they buy the same car or whatever you're like okay I, I was right in that and you see this in religious communities when somebody makes a faith commitment when they become a christian for example they've walked the aisle they come back from camp whatever and they're all excited on fire for god eventually they're they're going to slip back into their old routine of life and even ministries know that if you can get that person in that stage to evangelize their friends like it helps them grow in their faith there's like this this boost to it all that to say in my experience in ministry there were so many people in church leadership or ministry leadership that were always trying to call others into church leadership or into ministry mm. vocations mm -hmm. because they didn't have a theology of vocation that said God calls people into different things and we need to honor all that. It was always, I think, rooted in this latent self-doubt about their own calling and their own vocation. But if I can get more people to come into ministry, if I can make more people follow the path I've taken, then it reaffirms that I made the right decision too. Taking this all the way back to the natalism, at least the, the form that J.D. Vance is advocating here, I wonder if part of that's what's going on, is deep down are some people like, oh, I'm not sure I'm happy with the way my life is going. I'm not sure <laughs> I should have gotten, I'm not sure if I should have, I'm going to push this on everyone else because it will make, it'll reaffirm my decision when deep down, maybe I'm not as secure in it as I think I am. And I won't admit that to myself, but getting other people to make the same life choices I made makes me feel better about myself. It's a way of soothing an insecure identity rather than purely advocating for what you believe to be good for others. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. And I do think this is something that just, that does happen. I don't think that it's possible for me from the outside to peer into the heart of any given person of and course say, not. Right. this is what's going on. But I do think there's definitely something to what you say sort of writ large about a lot of the choices that we make um, to join a political party, to go work for an organization, to you name it. There's mm -hmm. a lot of self-convincing that we do that we've made the right choice. I know I do it. <laughs> I definitely do it. We do. We all do. I know. I've, after I've made a hard decision, 
I have a strong inclination to ser- search out information that confirms the rightness of my decision. And I have mm-hmm. to guard against that. You have to be aware of it and guard against it. You, no one wants to feel alone in their decision. They want yeah. to believe that others who you value affirm it and are going to go along with you in it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and also, but I also think there's something else going on that's quite resonant, especially in the social media internet era, and that is cheap virtue. And there's this very cheap virtue that you see online, which is essentially the really important aspect of me are what my beliefs are that I vocalize and that I'm going to be defined by my social media feed, or I'm gonna be defined by all of the things I stand for. And so that it becomes very important within various subcultures of American life to be out there vocalizing your solidarity with your tribe or with the viewpoint of the moment. And it's gotten really extreme at this point, Sky. So for example, you know, I'm most familiar with it on the right because I've grew up in conservative circles. I live in evangelical America. I live in MAGA America. But it really is remarkable how you can see trends and fads sort of sweep through where it's very important in that moment that you get on the right side of this trend or on the right side of the fad. And we've seen it with anti-CRT stuff. We've seen it with anti-LGBT stuff. We've seen it with the DEI things. And you'll notice a lot of these get related but you know, there's also sort of a fad and or a trend that's flown through on pronatalism. That if you're on the right, you're going to be pronatalist, right? And and in some ways, it gets weird and bad really fast <laughs> because it is related to and with a lot of these things. As soon as it becomes a big fad, and it becomes a big part of sort of the right wing subculture, it gets oppositional and it gets angry and grievance filled very quickly. So it's not just enough to say, you know, hey, look to you folks out there who want to have kids, but you don't know if you're up for it or you don't know if you can afford it. And you say, hey, look, I had some of the same concerns as you did. And here's what I found, which I think is a very helpful way of framing these things versus, well, you know, if you don't want to have children or if you don't want to have more children, you're just inherently selfish. <laughs> you're, right. you're, you know, you're inherently sociopathic. And the interesting thing, Sky, about a lot of this is how it's actually opposite of the data because the data shows that parents right now, with the notable exception of the French, <laughs> a group of people we'll get to later. Yes. But, uh, with the, the, the data shows that modern parents across cultures spend more time with their children even though they have fewer kids. And so it really cuts against this narrative that says that the reason we're having fewer children is we're just so self-centered and we're just so materialistic and we're just so into ourselves. No, they, the, the data shows that actually parents are pouring into their kids in a way that's substantially more time consuming than it was when I was growing up. I mean, I was, uh, on a podcast with Allison Camerata from uh, uh, CNN, and she's she's written a book about that. One of the th- discussions is what she calls the unparented generation, talking about Gen X. Uh huh. And every Gen X kid gets that. Yep. Com- compared to current parenting culture, now I had a wonderful home, wonderful parents, loved my childhood, but by by contrast to the intensity of current parenting styles. It's almost like we were unparented. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm younger than you, but I am also Gen X. And yeah, I, I think I have one daughter still in high school. And I think I know way more about what her life looks like than my parents knew about my life in high school. That's totally, sure. yeah. totally. Yeah, absolutely. And so this sort of idea that says what's happening is that there's just this universe of selfish people. And me, the guy who's had kids, is selfless and I stand for virtue and you stand for selfishness, which is sort of the way the kind of natalist argument has morphed and moved into is just 180 degrees from the truth. It's, it's actually that you're talking to a lot of parents, you're talking to a lot of young people who say, wait a minute, I am pouring everything I have into my family. I, I don't know what you're talking about here when you call, right. my, call me selfish. What are you saying? I think there are other aspects of this that I find more interesting than just whether or not people have children or how many children they have. I think a a more fruitful discussion would be 
the trends that show people are waiting much longer to have children. Mm -hmm. And it's also because people are getting married much later. And there's lots been written on delayed adolescence or delayed adulthood, prolonged adolescence and all those dynamics. And then related to that, and this is where I think J.D. Vance may have a valid point, related to that are the structures and economic systems of our society. And he's saying that we need to push for policies that are more uh, family friendly and, and child um, child engineered, centered, yeah. child centered, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. when you look at the way we may have grown up and some of the economic realities of the 1970s and 80s versus what we're seeing today, it is harder for families to get by to care for children. Um, healthcare costs are much higher, educational costs are much higher, housing costs are much higher. We don't have paid family leave in this country. There's all kinds of barriers that make people think I can't have more children or I can't start having children and I don't. So I think there is a case to be made for as a society, there are things we could do in policy to affirm the value of having children and, and having them even younger than what we're currently seeing in, in our culture. So there, I, I, I kind of wish J.D. JD Vance's rhetoric had focused more on that front than on disparaging people who don't have children or wait to have children as sociopaths and selfish yeah. and uninvested in America. And on a, I mean, it's just like, it's a completely wrong tack to take here. You know, and, but the thing that's important, and I, I think this is one thing that I think, um, just as a general matter, when you introduce complexity, it should enhance humility. And, yes. and so this issue with low birth rates, if it's across all cultures, including cultures that are, you know, sort of hyper capitalist red and tooth and claw and cultures that are extremely sort of cradle to grave welfare societies mm -hmm. with large amounts of paid family leave, with large amounts of support for mothers who have children, and they're all having decreasing birth rates or having birth rates below replacement level. It really does make us sort of hit the pause button and say, wait, is there something going on here that is just not susceptible to a policy solution? I mean, we have seen authoritarian countries sort of back up the dump truck and dump money onto families to try to get them to have kids. And then at the same time, they're scolding them, telling them, have kids, have kids, and they don't do it, right? Mm -hmm. And and then we've had other approaches. There's been carrots, there's been sticks, there's been so many different approaches. And it's not to say that nothing makes any difference ever. But one of the key things that we have seen is a lot of the differences, even with some of the most extreme pro-natalist policies, is the difference is very temporary. It's a blip. So, you know, say if Hungary just dumps a bunch of money on, on moms to have babies, what happens is they'll sort of move up their childbearing but they don't have more kids. They just right. do it sooner to take advantage of the program, you know? And so it, it, it's so complicated. I mean, I, if, if I'm gonna list all of the things that, you know, really plague Western civilization and civilization more broadly, lower birth rates to me among, are among the most complicated, most mysterious in the total universality of it all, and most difficult to change a sort of of all the culture-wide phenomenon, there is one thing that I, I feel pretty confident about, and that is hectoring people by calling them childless cat ladies is not the way through the wilderness here. <laughs> Amen. Um, before we leave this topic, I mentioned at the beginning that some people enter into this conversation primarily concerned with the economics of population. And if people aren't having enough children, you can't have a thriving economy. And one of the reasons the United States still has a thriving economy, despite the fact that we have a very low birth rate, is immigration. Immigration, yep. We are replacing those who are leaving the workforce with people born and raised here who are entering it, but also with people who are coming to the country as immigrants. And so purely on an economic front, I, I have yet to understand how you know, the party that is both anti-immigration and pro economy or claims to be pro-capitalism can do that when, to your point, there, no one in any of these economies has found a way to stimulate more childbirth through economic policies or government policies. So they seem to be, they seem to be holding contradictory values at the same time. We, don't, yes. we want a thriving economy, but we don't want a strong immigrant 
population here. Is anyone I'm pointing that out to the right right now? I'm so glad you said that, Sky. And there's even an additional layer of nonsense to it. So um, first, if you're going to say we want to dramatically restrict immigration to this country to, quote, preserve our culture. And then you say, hey, guys, we can't we're not sustaining our culture uh, with the, the low birth rates, et cetera. And they say, no, no, no. We'll fix this by getting people to have more kids. OK, who's succeeded at that? Exactly. Well, no, nobody except Israel and Israel's a unique case. That's not a plan. That's just a hope, right? That's just a hope. But here's another factor, Sky, that really bothers me about the immigration debate. There's an enormous number of people who are concerned about a secularizing America. Mm -hmm. And then they're also very concerned about not having more people move here from the global south. Where do you think religious people are living right now? It's mm -hmm. not Northern Europe. You know, it's not it's not Scandinavia. In many ways, the religious culture of South America, of, you know, big chunks of Africa, including into, you know, some parts of Asia, some of these cultures are more Christian and so are more to recognizably faith centered and faith based than you know, the European cultures that were so key to sort of the beginning of the American experiment. And so there's this sort of weird thing that's going on where you say, okay, I want economic growth and I also want religion to be alive and vital in the United States and I don't want more immigration. Whoa, those are not consistent, compatible kinds of approaches. And I, I remember there was a moment where, you know, uh, a few years ago, I wrote a piece when this law professor named Amy Wax was talking about defending American culture by bringing in more immigrants from Europe and fewer from, say, South America. And I was like, wait, a Northern European is far more secular. That's right. Than the median American. And, and so in a very key way, Northern Europe is not a cultural match for us in the same way that, say, a person from Brazil might be a cultural match for us in some very concrete ways. And so mm -hmm. it, the, the American culture is, is just simply not a transplant of Western Europe to this continent. It is not. And the so, sooner people recognize that, the better off we are. Okay, so let's cut through the, the rhetoric a little bit and talk about what's really going on in that, because you're right. Immigrants who come to this country, especially from the global south, are more Christian, have stronger family values, greater work ethic, and lower crime rates than yeah. indigenous Americans, right? Yeah. And yet, you know, going back to the Trump administration, he was complaining about why are we getting immigrants from, you know, whole countries, and right. why can't we get more from, from Norway? You just got the Sweden. E rating. You just got I know, the E rating. We'll, we'll, we'll bleep that. But it's a quote. It's a direct <laughs> quote. I wasn't making that on my own. But... I mean, can we just be honest at what it's really about? It's not about faith. It's not about work ethic. It's not about the economy. It's not about family values. None of that stuff. It's that the immigrants coming from the global south are people of color. And immigrants that would come from northern or western Europe are white. When cutting through all of it, is that really what this comes down to? Yeah, you know, for a, for a disturbingly large number of people, Sky, that's what it comes down to. For because a disturbing... Like for conservatives who care about the economy, who care about family values, and who care about Christian faith, we should be excited to have those people coming into this country. But that's not the case. So I, that, it just right. seems we're across purposes here. There's certainly, and this, this is where I, I stand, I am very, very pro-immigration. Mm -hmm. I also know that there's such a thing as too much too soon. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And, that, and we're not even talking about the border crisis right, and right. actually keeping track and documenting who's coming in and how and when. Like, I right. think we're all in favor for law and order on the southern border. Yeah. But we need a good, functional, legal immigration system is, is what we, I think we both advocate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the other things that I think is really important, and I, I hate to go back to Ronald Reagan on this, but look, he was able to recognize the fact that so many people want to come here is something that we should be very proud of. And not just proud of, but facilitate in lawful and reasonable ways. And right. so this sort of idea that says immigration is a threat is a 180 degree switch from the entire way that I grew up, which was immigration is a validation of the American mm -hmm. experiment. 
everything that you're seeing here with people rushing to come to this country is a validation of what we have built. It's an affirmation of what we have built. And it's not a threat to it. It's not a threat to it. In fact, it's indispensable in sustaining this whole experiment. It's indispensable. And so when I look at immigration, I think of it as an indispensable affirmation of the American experiment. And I would be far more worried about America the moment that people don't want to come here. And, and that seems to be in many ways the way that parts of the hard right want us to be so repulsive to immigration that what, what's the end game here? You know, what's the end game here when it comes to sealing and shutting down and closing off immigration? And, and I, it just feels so backwards to our DNA yeah. that we would take that approach. Okay, I know we're getting off track and we got one other story we really got to cover, but what concerns me is you mentioned that the right wants to make America so off-putting that people wouldn't want to come here anymore. And to a degree it's working, but I don't think it's working with the population they intend. So we're still seeing massive numbers of people come across the southern border who are seeking economic betterment for themselves and their families. I know of people in my family who live overseas. My father was an immigrant from India who, when I've talked to them about, you know, are you planning to come to the U.S. for college? Are you planning to come to the U.S. to start your business, work like that? Their response is, no way. I don't want to go to the U.S. Uh, you have too much gun violence and you clearly don't want brown people there. And mm -hmm. yet these are highly educated, very affluent, the types of people who come into a country and start businesses and create jobs and better the economy. They're going to Australia. They're going to Singapore. They're going to Europe. They're going. They're not wanting to come yeah. to the U.S. anymore. And that's exactly the kind of immigrant you want, and that we used to attract in this country, because of the economic strength and opportunity that America represented. So, all this negative anti-immigrant rhetoric coming from the right is not stopping the poorer immigrants who are still coming right. across the southern border, but it is stopping the highly educated, affluent immigrant who could come here and do. A lot of good. So it, all of it just seems so completely stupid. And it's, it, yeah. So anyway. Yeah. It, well, it, right. It, it's self defeating. Um, right. It's playing into bigotries. And again, I'll say it again none of this is saying we just open the borders. <laughs> but what it's talking about right. is what is our fundamental disposition towards immigration, asset or liability. And I think the fundamental American disposition towards immigration has been, should be, and should always be, it's an asset. And there are ways in which you can manage that asset irresponsibly to where there are liabilities that attach to it that shouldn't, but fundamentally immigration is an asset to the United States of America. This episode is sponsored in part by World Relief, the humanitarian organization we trust to tackle the challenges at the border and around the world. Do you want to push back against suffering and injustice, but find yourself wondering, can I really make a difference? The answer is simple. Yes, you can. Together with listeners like you, World Relief is responding to millions affected by conflict, mass displacement, food insecurity, and so much more. When you join The Path, World Relief's monthly giving community, you partner with World Relief in bringing lasting change across the globe. Your yes to joining The Path will help World Relief say yes to millions experiencing vulnerability. You can make a difference, and let's do it together. Learn more at worldrelief.org slash holypost. Again, it's worldrelief.org slash holypost. Okay. So switching gears a little bit, but staying on the topic of secular Europe and uh, its, it's very um, antagonistic values to much of modern American culture, the Paris Olympics started last weekend and the opening ceremony, which we talked about a little bit on this week's Holy Post podcast, included a, a lot of weird stuff, as one might expect from the French. But one thing in particular caused a lot of outrage, and that was... Uh, a scene that appeared to many people to look like da Vinci's depiction of the Last Supper. But instead of being populated with Jesus and his apostles, it appeared to be populated by drag queens or gender nonconforming 
folks dressed in in some pretty provocative stuff. Uh, Paris organizers have said that no, no, this was not intended to be the Last Supper. It was intended to be a scene of, of Greek mythology from the Feast of Dionysus, and everyone's misinterpreting it. Anybody who was offended, we apologize, but that wasn't the intent. It hasn't stopped the outrage, both here in the U.S., but also in other parts of the world, especially from the Catholic Church. David French, being French, <laughs> what is your defense? <laughs> what is your defense of this uh, sacrilegious scene? <laughs> At the at the opening ceremonies, I I don't have a I don't have a prosecution case and I don't have a defense case. I have an I don't care case. But we're going to um, talk about it anyway. We're talking about it anyway, and I fear it's like sort of misleading because we're going to spend more time on it than I actually care. But I do think okay. that there there is a reason to talk about it anyway. Um, so why wouldn't I care? I feel I'm not convinced by the explanation that says, oh, this was the Feast of Dionysus. There were performers right. who thought this was the Last Supper. Um, I, di I didn't like it. Like, I looked at it. I didn't mm -hmm. like it. Um, You're not going to frame that picture in your house somewhere? No, didn't mm -hmm. enjoy it. Also, did not care. Um, yeah. And, and so, and, and, and let me explain that a little bit, um, because there was a point in my life, Sky, when I was a younger man, I would have I cared. I would have been mad about it, and I would have said exactly what a lot of people said on Twitter. Oh, you went against us Christians because we're an easy target. I'll respect your brave truth-telling if you did that for Islam, right? Right. And because yeah. we all know the French would never do that for yep. Islam. It would not happen for a million different reasons. And so I, there's a time, and then you know what I began to realize, Sky, was that in a weird way, my anger was making the next blasphemous display inevitable. So in other words, the fact that I cared so much and the fact that I was angry and was reacting strongly to things like this, it was triggering the reaction that the artist wanted to trigger. Right. Right, it's, and like, so, it's like when a child throws a tantrum; it, they're trying to get a reaction from the parent. My mom, in her you know wise parenting, used to remind us that if you throw a tantrum, I'm going to throw it right back at you because you're yeah. not going to you're not going to be able to embarrass me. It's not going to work. <laughs> so, but that is essentially it. They're throwing a tantrum and they want to get a reaction. They want to get a reaction, and so the thing that I've you know come to realize over time is th the fact that I'm not provoked is actually the best answer to this stuff. And it actually is more likely to create a world in which people are not gratuitously offending religious people because they're not getting the reaction that they want. It's just, it just disappears into the ether. Okay, but David, I, I affirm that. I also did, I didn't really care when I saw it either. And, and I joked on our Holy Post show that I just thought it was the most French thing ever. Like it's yeah, the, the, oh true that they true have yeah a, they have a very long history of of mocking religion, um, but do we have sort of a collective action problem here? Because it's fine that David French doesn't get offended and react to the French opening Olympics. It's fine if Sky doesn't do that, but there are thousands and thousands, if not millions, of Christians, including many on social media, who are reacting. So does our little. Uh, you know, non-reactive posture toward this really make any difference when the artists are going to get the reaction they sought and there is outrage online everywhere and you can count on humanity to be outraged around things that it would probably be better for them not to be but i'm not saying it's a reason for us not to take yeah. the posture we have but does it really make a difference well you know institutions and organizations and communities are learning organisms we can learn lessons and we can also sadly unlearn lessons. And I think it is quite possible for a community to learn the lesson that perhaps the best and actually most effective response to an intentional provocation is boredom. Um, and that actually teaching people that as a movement, that this sort of how dare you mindset. And I, you know, at one point, Senator Katie Britt was demanding that Kamala Harris condemn the French opening ceremonies, that this kind of lifestyle that says, I am going to leap to take offense, um, A, is ineffective in the sense that, but what if the purpose was offense? And then B, also, in many ways, it's a, it's a tougher way to live as a person. 
because you're just you're always going to find something in a world mm -hmm. where we are sojourners we are you know we are not you know scripture teaches us this is not our home and if we're going to start to get angry at everything that makes us feel not at home in the place that's not our home then we're going to just be constantly lurching from outrage to outrage to outrage because they're they're just omnipresent they're just out there and so i do think it's a far more i think in many ways powerful way to approach the culture to say i'm not impacted by your provocation i'm not going to be deterred from living the life that i believe christ calls me to live but i'm also just not going to be impacted by your provocation um and i think that there's a some real genuine power in that um, because when you decide you're not going to be impacted by that provocation one of the things that it actually ends up doing in many ways is preserves this ability and this way in which we can interact with people who sharply disagree with us or maybe so hostile to christianity that they want to offend us and it is extremely counterintuitive to them when you are not, when you are not angry, when you are not offended. I think that is a kind of response that actually opens doors versus sort of being, um, you know, being the person that in many ways the, the, your, your religious sort of antagonists can almost manipulate you or can manipulate you. What do you, what do you say to the Christian who, says, well, I am reacting because I am defending the honor of Christ. And out of love and respect for him, I will defend his honor when it is uh, obscenely insulted in my culture or in media or in government, whatever it might be. And it's my way of honoring and worshiping God by defending his reputation, his honor, his, you know, when someone uses the Lord's name in vain or whatever the, the action may be, I'm defending that glory and honor that is above all things. Well, first, the best way to defend and and the the to the extent that Jesus, you know, one part of the Godhead, creator of the universe, like really needs me, my David French, <laughs> some lawyer in Middle Tennessee needs my defense. I mean, it's almost laughable at the, that whole concept when you're talking about the God of the universe, the Son of God, the part of the Trinity, and so at, at one level it's kind of laughable but i've always sort of thought that the best way to quote unquote defend if we're going to use that language or uphold the honor of jesus is trying to live as much like him mm -hmm. as i can as a fallen human being and and one of the things that you see in scripture is actually jesus endured the worst of insults the worst of insults and he had the greatest capacity to defend his own honor <laughs> and right. he had far more capacity to defend himself than i have to defend jesus my defense of jesus is meaningless compared to what he could do for himself and yet he literally subjected himself to torture and mockery by a hostile pagan empire and so what was inflicted on jesus that jesus endured willingly is a hundred thousand times worse than what we watched on television, right? Now, that's not, that doesn't mean that what we watched on television was good or right. As I said, I, I didn't yeah. like it. I didn't enjoy seeing it. I didn't like anything about it. But this idea that now it's my time to defend Jesus, that's much more Elon Musk theology than <laughs> biblical theology. For those who don't know what I'm referring to, Musk basically put out a tweet that, said unless christianity is defended it will go extinct right you know and which is very trumpy trumpy yeah. trump has said similar things that he's going to defend mm -hmm. christianity whatever have yeah. you ever read the novel uh silence by susuku endo or seen the movie that um martin scorsese made of it i've not and that's my fault oh it is your fault i know you, i know you must I'm sorry you, i watch either i mean the movie's great but the the novel is phenomenal it's it's set in uh, feudal Japan, kind of the same era as Shogun, if you watch that show. And it's Loved about it. it's about these two Portuguese priests that sneak into the country when Christianity was banned and sort of underground, 
they were known as the crypto Christians at the time, but these two Portuguese priests sneak into the country because they're looking for their long lost mentor who had gone to Japan and disappeared. And Christians are severely persecuted in Japan at this time. And it's it focuses on this one priest, I think it's Rodrigo is his name, and his struggle, his determination not to um, recant his faith despite enormous persecution and pain and all right that. and i don't want to ruin it because it's it's a beautiful haunting powerful story but what it really brings forward is kind of the point you're making which is that jesus came into the world to be mocked and spit upon and despised and ridiculed and rejected and when we step in thinking well we need to defend his honor what's really going on there is it's not that he can't take the worst that the world can do. It's we can't take it. Yeah. We want we want our yeah. identity as a Christian to be respected and honored and upheld. And so we say we're defending Jesus, but really what we're trying to do is defend ourselves. And so yeah. the out the outrage that people are expressing about the opening ceremony of the Olympics, they might say, "Well, I am standing up for the truth, or I'm standing up for Jesus, or I'm defending my faith." Let's be honest, you're defending yourself. Your identity was mocked as a Christian and you feel wounded by that. And rather than accepting it the way Jesus did and turning around and loving your enemy, you want to stick it to the people who insulted you and make yourself feel important again. It's um, it's like will to power Christianity essentially says, well, Jesus went to the cross so that we don't have to. Right. And that anything that smells even a little cross-like <laughs> Yeah. We're going to ignoring the words of the apostle who said that Jesus suffered, that we should follow in his steps or take up your cross like and follow. Yeah. So. Right. Or right, sharing I mean, the sufferings of Jesus. Yeah. 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 And so. So Go a lot of it. On. Yeah. And so so much is anything that sniffs of cross, anything that like sniffs of mockery, anything that sniffs of something like that. We're going to absolutely arch our back against. We're going to sort of bow up against it and say, how dare you? How dare you? And, you know, that that instinct, A, I think it's totally playing into what the artist is wanting to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember a lot of there's all this discussion of this would never happen. And even in the recent past, and I'm like. Guys, do you not know about the French Revolution and right, how, exactly. <laughs> you know, like they would put up the goddess of reason in the altar of churches during the French Revolution. They were, you, you talk about purging France of its Catholicism for a time period during the, Rev my gosh, the hostility. Man, the French, French Christians at that time would have looked at what they saw in the Olympic opening ceremonies and say, that's all you have to worry about? Yeah, yeah, that was mild. Yeah. That was mild. Or, you know, when I was, I think when I was in law school, it was the artist Andres Serrano who had this mm -hmm. art display called Piss Christ, which was like mm -hmm. a crucifix and urine. That was the whole art display. Does he do that at all, at all, if he thought nobody would care? Right. If it bored everybody, if they just thought, oh, look, that's not art. He's just trying to, he's just trying to make people mad, you know, then none of you know a lot of these things just don't happen because what you're doing is you're giving exactly the the reaction that the artist was seeking to give you're making the point the artist often was trying to prove and so it creates that's why i sort of even when i don't like it there's nothing i like about that serrano art exhibit there's nothing mm -hmm. i like about that thing on the bridge in paris but to say, to not give it any power over me, is itself a power. <laughs> yeah, I, it reminds me many years ago when I was a young editor at CT, I was interviewing a Christian leader who will remain nameless, um, but he, he gave me some really good advice. He was often criticized. This is in the early, early, early stages of social media. And he was the focus of a lot of criticism. And I asked him just, how do you, how do you handle it so graciously? And he gave me this metaphor. He said, you know, when people throw mud on you, if you try to get it off, you just make a bigger mess of it all. And he said, if you just let the mud sit there for a little bit, it'll dry up and eventually it just falls off. So the, the key is to just not take the bait. Don't react immediately and you'll do much better. And I think that's similar to what you seem to be saying here. But, okay, related to this, though, beyond the provocation that an artist or a, an anti-Christian critic may, may be seeking, 
How does it fit into the, the very common thing you see in American evangelicalism, which is this persecution narrative that people yeah. want to believe that they are being persecuted and see, look there, the Paris opening ceremony, that's proof that the world hates us or, you know, go on down the list of, of persecution um, hyperbole that seems to be going on in our culture day. What do you think is driving that in the American Christian subculture? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Sky. And I've, I've thought a lot about this because just as I talked about earlier, a younger version of me would be tweeting like a madman. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. you're so brave. Do that to Islam, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A younger version of me had a very different narrative of persecution in the U.S. And, and part of this is when you grow up in a fundamentalist background, it's the air you breathe, it's the water you drink. And essentially what the air you breathe and the water you drink is, is anything negative that happens to Christians, and there are many negative things that happen to Christians in the United States, is persecution. So if you hear that a Christian student group is thrown off a college um, campus, persecution. And then you hear of a Christian football coach not being permitted to pray in the end zone, persecution. You hear, and so you hear all of these stories, and this is just what you hear, what you hear, what you hear. And so you think, well, there's a large group of very powerful Americans who just flat out don't like Christians, and they are engaged in persecution. And then it it clicks with something, a deeply embedded sort of sense in a lot of us that we want to be we want to be heroic, courageous figures who stand up for Christ when things are hard. This is part of the story we tell ourselves about who we're supposed to be. And so there's something that almost feels counterfeit in a way if you can't look at people and say, I paid a price for my Christianity. Right. You know, then do you, are you really a Christian? What do you know about your faith, et cetera? So there's almost this weird kind of longing. I'm not going to say for persecution, because if you've actually experienced true persecution, you yeah. don't long for it. Right. But there's a kind of longing for a kind of particular adversity that you perceive that you face because of your Christianity. Yeah, there's that silly uh, cliche that people throw around that if you're taking flack, it's because you're over the target. Right, right, exactly. And, and so if I'm struggling, suffering, whatever, it's because I'm doing something right. I am doing yeah. what God wants me to do. So it's a validation of your faith if you're persecuted. And let me tell you what began to shift my mind and heart on this guy. Because again, you know, I, I want to be super transparent with people. Um, you know, I'm in the, I'm a, I'm a work in progress. I'm a, I'm a, in the process of sanctification. And so I look at a lot of voices online and I think, thank God Twitter didn't exist 25 years ago. I've thought that many times. Or I might be that person, right? And so it's one of the reasons why I don't directly and aggressively take on a lot of these younger tweeting Christians, because I, honestly, I see myself in them a bit. Mm. But here's what began to shift my frame. I was working on a case, one of these cases, where again, a Christian had their constitutional rights violated. In other words, existing, a, a, a government entity treated them in a way that violated the free exercise clause classic case where you would say they're persecuted. That's how the language I would have used at the time. And, and we took the case, we won the case, justice was done. They got their, their, their individual liberty, all worked out. And then years later, I was interacting with somebody who actually worked at the school that we had litigated against. Okay. And the story they told was horrifying, Sky they were persecuted by Christians. So when the school took this action, which was, which did violate the rights of, of but they did it in part because they didn't know what to do. They had received some bad legal advice from in-house counsel, but they didn't have malice towards Christians. They were doing what they thought they had to do under the establishment clause. To protect were, other students. To protect yes. other students. They were okay. wrong on the law and they lost. Mm -hmm. But when they told the story of what they experienced at the hands of Christians, it was downright chilling. From death threats, to screaming encounters at parking lots, to insults of family members. You know what it sounded an awful lot like, Sky? What we Christians would call persecution if it was directed at us. So what you were 
what you thought you were defending originally was Christian persecution, but in fact, it was just Christians reaping what they'd sown. Well, in many ways, also Christians were inflicting on others worse than what had been inflicted on them. And what I began to see was something that's happening in this culture is that once Christians got deeply, the Christians that get deeply involved in the culture wars, it's not that they're persecuted, Sky. It's more like they give as good as they get. Mm. That they, they're just one more very powerful faction in a highly polarized country. And yeah, people get angry at them and they code all of the anger that people have at them as persecution. And then they persecute others and code that as righteousness. And this is one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand. It is not that everybody loves Christians in America or everyone loves evangelicals. Yeah, there are a lot of people who don't like evangelicals who, if they could, would not permit a Christian student group on campus. But at the same time, what you also see when you talk to people who've been in mainstream media, when you talk to people in the institutions where Christians have filed lawsuits, they will tell you stories that will shock your conscience about how Christians have treated them. And what I wish, what I wish, Sky, is I almost wish you could have a, a situation where you take every Christian culture warrior and put them, embed them in a secular organization that has been quote unquote deemed hostile to Christianity and sit in their shoes and watch the way Christians treat the individuals in that organization mm -hmm. and spend a year being on the receiving end of it and realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not a situation like you have in Nigeria where Boko Haram comes in and just wipes out a church, burns it to the ground, kills innocent people. What you actually have here are two political factions, neither of which is behaving terribly Christ-like, mm -hmm. going at each other hammer and tongs, but one of them is calling that conflict persecution. Um, and I think that's, and again, that's not to excuse any unconstitutional action sure. at all, but to understand more fully what's happening. So, okay, I don't mean to minimize this or, or, or oversimplify it, but it feels to me like a basic guiding principle here could simply be do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here's what, here's what it reminds me of. M many years ago, I was invited to speak at an event, a Christian event. They were looking for somebody to address the question of uh, religious liberty and gay rights. And this was before Obergefell. And I somehow got myself wrapped into this and I agreed to do this talk. And I was kind of nervous because it's the first talk I'd ever done publicly on that topic. And I wasn't mm -hmm. obviously approaching it from a legal point of view like you right. would, but more of a, a, a Christian leader point of view. And I, I was working on a draft of this talk and I, happened, I had met somebody who was connected to the human rights campaign, you know, this very pro-gay rights group. And I reached out to her and I said, I'm working on this talk and I would really love your input on it. She knew I came from a different theological yeah. point of view and various things. She set up a conference call with her and a number of other of her colleagues from the Human Rights Campaign. And I was on the conference call and I was explaining what I was doing. And the, I thought the call had gone dead because I wasn't hearing anything from the other side. And finally, I was like, are you guys still there? And someone spoke up finally and said, well, let me get this straight. You're an evangelical pastor? I said, yes. You're speaking at an evangelical conference about gay rights and religious liberty. I said, yes. And you're asking us to give you input on your talk and you want us to review the manuscript? And I said, yes. And he said, and you don't agree with you know, all of our positions? I said, no, I don't. But I said, I, I want to make sure that what I present is in no way unintentionally offensive. And we're going to disagree on certain things here, but I want to make sure we're disagreeing on what I intend to disagree on. And I want to make sure that my language and what I'm saying is respectful and, we, and, I'm, and I'm representing your point of view accurately. And they were stunned by this because I guess they had not encountered a Christian who would ask for their input on this. And some of them ended up attending the event because I had talked to them in advance. Like I, that, that to me just feels like what I would want if, if tables were turned. 
And so rather than engaging in this winner take all culture war posture, why not begin with the assumption of treating one another with respect and dignity that we would want? And yes, there's going to be conflicts and mistakes and constitutional things that need to be worked out, sometimes at the point of, of courts and lawsuits. But so much of this could be avoided if we just cared enough about our neighbors to ask them, are you offended by something I've done? You know, and, and Sky, when you are a consistent civil libertarian, you're going to run afoul of left and right. You're yes. going to run afoul of secular people and you're going to run afoul of Christians. And so, and then especially, you know, in this latest era where I've not supported Donald Trump, and that's an understatement, <laughs> I've run afoul of where most evangelical, especially white evangelicals are. So I've been on at odds with the secular left and I've been at odds with the religious right. Mm-hmm. I have received more cruelty, more threats, more anger, more rage, more dishonesty, more malice from the religious right than I've received from the secular left. And, and the secular left has not exactly been kind many times. In, in, in fact, it can have, has been quite sometimes cruel and threatening in its own right. But the world that you inhabit when you cross the political religious right in this country, you will see the claws fast. And these are the same people who will run around on Fox bleeding about persecution constantly and negative world this and negative world that. And and here's the sad thing, Sky. Millions of American evangelicals who are not involved in the culture war, who are just living their lives, watching the media that they watch, they absolutely have no clue. They have no clue what hap what the experience is uh, of people who cross the religious right. They have no clue. So they are in highly informed about every student group kicked off campus. They're highly informed about every single unconstitutional attack on, say, a Christian adoption agency. They're very familiar with that. And so it's easy for them to then feel like, well, I'm embattled. And they're not at all familiar with the pain and agony that, quote, Christians inflict on people that cross them mm -hmm. in this culture war context. They have no clue about it. In fact, it's so alien to them that their initial reflexive response is just, that can't be right. Yeah. That can't I, be right. It reminds me, many years ago, I heard Eugene Peterson give a talk where he, based on John 14, where Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he talked about how we cannot separate the truth of Jesus from the way of Jesus. Yes. And in so much of the culture war, people are defending, quote unquote, the truth of Jesus, but they're doing it in a way which is completely contrary to the way of Jesus. And um, that's sad and tragic. But we are out of time. David, thank you for uh, <laughs> this fascinating, wide-ranging conversation from uh, J.D. Vance's critique of single sociopaths and natalism and immigration to the Paris Olympics and not taking offense and what does it mean to transcend the culture wars. Love having you on here every month. And I'm sure next month will give us a whole new set of, of crazy things that we could potentially talk about. Well, thanks, Sky. And just, just to put a period on the end of everything, we got to give the people what they want. Robert oh, Downey right. Jr. Sorry, forgot about that. All I was going to say is, I just endorse him in anything. <laughs> I okay. mean, I, I just like more Robert Downey Jr. on the silver screen. So him as Dr. Doom, I'm all in. And then five years from now, when he's, you know, reborn Iron Man, I'm in with that too. I agree with you on that, but let me give you a slightly more cynical take. I, I'm, ex <laughs> I'm excited to see him back in the MCU. I think he's a phenomenal actor and whatever, pay him whatever he wants. I don't care. But I do worry that... I think the MCU jumped the shark a little while ago, but I think yeah. this represents a new phase where they are playing on the fans' nostalgia. And that's not a good sign for an IP like Marvel. And that worries me a little bit, but I'll withhold judgment until we see the end there, result. There are two signs I think you're, you're running out of ideas. One of them is the nostalgia hire. Mm -hmm. The other one is the multiverse. Yes, I, I've always that, that's where it jumped the shark for me was the yeah. multiverse stuff. I was kind of yep. done. Yeah, but all right, we will do a nerd out uh, <laughs> French Friday at some point here. I have not kept up on movies. I need to, but we'll do that in the near future. Thanks, David. 
Thanks so much, Sky. French Friday is a production of Holy Post Media, featuring David French and me, Sky Jatani. Music and theme song by Phil Vischer. This show is made possible by Holy Post patrons. To find out how you can become a Holy Post patron and to find more common good Christian content, go to holypost.com.